Start recording. Share application. Entire screen. Share. Tell me that there's a PowerPoint up. Yep. Excellent. All right. So first unit in chemistry uh, starts out pretty basic here, starting with the basic structure and building blocks that chemistry is. So starting about the, uh, we'll start with the atom, uh, talk about molecules, building on, on atoms, uh, protons, neutrons, all that kind of wonderful stuff. And then we'll start getting into what happens when we add some atoms together and then we start making molecules and then we make compounds and mixtures and stuff like that. So uh, if you have done chemistry in high school, uh, 10, 11, or 12, this should be uh, pretty similar to that, and you shouldn't have much problem with it. If you have not done chemistry before, uh, just keep in mind that this is fairly basic, um, and it, it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, if you have problems with this, there's a website that I recommend, and it's called The Con. Academy, K-H-A-N Academy, uh, and it's a very good website for all things educational, whether it's chemistry or math or calculus or literature or whatever, um, but if you find you need more uh, information, that's a great site to check out. Um, so anyway, let's, let's move on here. Uh, matter, anything that occupies space and has mass, again, uh, orange text uh, generally directs you to the uh, theme of the ILM and the self-test type uh, questions. So there we go, um, starting out with matter. So what is matter? Anything that occupies space and has mass. Okay, why do we need to learn this stuff? We need a basic knowledge of atomic structure so that we can understand the operation of analyzers and to understand the chemical processes that occur in industrial plants. Um, that ties in well with third year and liquid analyzers, which we uh, spend a lot of time on. So it will be useful uh, to you. Okay, composition of matter, page two. We we'll talk about chemistry here as at a at its root base. Here, um, chemistry is comprised of both practical uh, study and theoretical study here, but it is in in whole uh, study of matter's composition, the properties of these uh, elements, and the structure and changes of these different elements here. So, uh, in a practical uh, application for us, we we look at analysis uh, and the observation of physical and chemical properties. A lot of the things we do in control systems, uh, analyzer-wise, would fall under uh, the analysis of mixtures uh, and uh, in observation of physical and chemical properties uh, in terms of the processes that uh, are done on raw resources that uh, we have uh, involvement with the control systems, things like distillation uh, that works on uh, physical properties like uh, boiling point uh, and condensation and things like that. Then, of course, there's the theoretical side of it, which we're going to discuss mostly today, uh, the structure uh, of, of atoms and elements and chemistry in general, the structure of pure substances, and then we look at the explanations and predictions of chemical reactions. So how they kind of uh, work together. And that's a little bit more than we're going to cover uh, in terms of depth. We're, we're kind of going to stay relatively basic, um, but we will get some understanding about uh, how some reactions uh, occur in a different, uh, different set of ILMs, chemical reactions that are later on in the course. Okay, so components of matter. Uh, molecules are the smallest units of matter and atoms make up molecules. So really, atoms are the smallest particle and we start combining them together. Together, We end up getting molecules and then by having different combinations of molecules and atoms, we can make up all the different elements that uh, the world is made up out of. Um, so this diagram here from the ILM shows you the composition of air, uh, which starts out with some oxygen atoms. Uh, one oxygen atom by itself uh, really doesn't do much, but we know oxygen as O2. And the reason that we use uh, O2 because it tells us about the um, the ratio of atoms in the molecular formula, and that's the introduction basically to formulas. And all the numbers that are attached in chemical formulas are basically just uh, recipe values like tablespoons or cups uh, that tell us what ratio of one component is in 
uh, relation to other components. So start out with a single atom, we combine two of them together, and then suddenly we have an oxygen molecule, uh, O2, and that's one of the major components of air, uh, of course, made up also of nitrogen, which would have a nitrogen atom, uh, and the gas nitrogen would be N2, um, similar to oxygen. So it, it basically builds the same way. Okay, matter normally exists in one of three physical states or phases, um, solid, liquids, or gases. Um, and the fourth one that we've introduced now into the ILM that I used to mention in previous lecture just for fun, uh, but is now included is plasma. Um, this is like the surface of the sun or when you're uh, welding, uh, things like that. That is the plasma that we're talking about. Uh, and the characteristics that are associated with each of these different uh, states or forms uh, is something that's important to us in third year. So solids have a fixed shape and a volume. So if we look at uh, the example here, uh, has a fixed shape, has a fixed volume, it doesn't really change. Liquid uh, has no fixed shape, but has a fixed volume. Uh, essentially, it'll take the shape of the vessel or container that it's in, but it's limited to the uh, physical size of the, of the volume of, of the liquid. Gas uh, has no fixed shape or volume. Oops, sorry about that. Has no fixed shape or volume, and basically what that means is a gas uh, relative to water, if we put the same amount of gas in this container, it will continue to reduce itself in density and spread it out uh, until it fills uh, any shape uh, at any volume, basically. So it has no fixed shape or volume. Water is held together molecularly a much, uh, much tighter, and the particles stay together and don't spread out. They only stay the size that they are. Gases are, are different in that way. Plasma, uh, no fixed shape or volume. Um, similar to a gas, uh, but they are conductive, produce magnetic fields, and respond to magnetic forces. So these are uh, basically the, the three physical states of matter. Okay, matter then further breaks down, uh, in our context anyway, in the ILM, into uh, things we'll talk about, uh, pure substances and mixtures. And we'll start out with pure substances in the next slide, I believe, uh, which uh, basically are composed of uh, individual elements, which are the elements on the periodic table, and then compounds uh, of these elements, so different recipes uh, of these elements put together, uh, still in a pure state, and we'll talk about how that can occur. Uh, and then we'll move from there into mixtures, um, and we break mixtures out into two different types of mixtures. Uh, the first type of a mixture is a homogeneous mixture, uh, and essentially a homogeneous mixture is a solution in which uh, once it's mixed, you cannot tell the individual components uh, of that mixture. This is in contrast to heterogeneous mixtures or sometimes called mechanical mixtures, which after mixed, you can still see the individual components. So an example of a homogeneous mixture um, of gases, for example, would be air. You can't see the oxygen or the nitrogen uh, in the air. Um, but they are there. Uh, a heterogeneous mixture would be something like concrete, where you can tell that there is sand in there. You can tell that there is rocks in there. Uh, so that's kind of the, the black and white sort of difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous. Okay, so pure substances, uh, breaking down there a little bit. Uh, fairly simple definition here. Consist of only one type of a substance. And further to take that, we have elements, which is only one kind of, of an atom and cannot be broken down anymore. Building from the element, we then have a compound, uh, which can be broken down and contains atoms in fixed ratios. So if we were look, looking at uh, an element, would be uh, oxygen or hydrogen. Uh, if I were to put them together in the formula H2O, that would be a compound because I have two different elements that can be separated. Um, oxygen as a molecule itself with the two of them uh, does not count as uh, a compound because they are this they are the same. They're one one type of a substance. So they're only uh, they're they're essentially an element. Once we put them together with something, it becomes a compound and then we can break them apart. Okay, each element again consists of one type of an atom. Uh, this slide just kind of 
is a little bit of an introduction. Uh, they've done a recent revision on the ILM, so the ILM that we are working out of today uh, was not the same ILM that I used in September. Uh, and they have added this a little bit, and the context has changed a little bit. So there's a little blurb in there uh, that talks about the origin of the names, not very uh, relevant, uh, but it does give you some idea. And it only works really for a few of the uh, elements on the periodic table. Uh, elements like iron, uh, which you know mentally you might want to think would be like capital I, capital R. Why isn't it that way? Well, it's just been around for so long that it got a Latin name way back when, and it kind of uh, stuck uh, compared to things like uh, manganese, which is MN, or copper, which is CU. Uh, well, I guess copper is, a, copper is a bad example. But some of the other ones that are more uh, associated uh, with the common name that we use. So that's kind of the origin of the name. Some of them have been around for a long time. Uh, we're still discovering some till this day. Uh, so looking at some of the most common elements, um, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, etc. Uh, you can see that they're more closely associated, some of these, to their actual word names. So silicon, SI, makes a little bit more sense. At any rate, all of these are just consisting of one particular atom. Okay, at this point in time, there are 118 different elements that have been identified. Of these, 98% of them are naturally occurring and 20 of them are produced. Okay, uh, I kind of hit on this a little bit when we talked about oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, by definition, they are what we call polyatomic elements. Uh, and these are elements that exist of molecules of more than one atom. Uh, they are represented by a molecular formula, which indicates the ratios, that is the subscript that we see in the chemical formula, which indicates the number of atoms. So you can see that hydrogen, uh, the gas is H2, oxygen, the gas is O2, ozone is O3, nitrogen is N2, chlorine is Cl2, and sulfur is actually S8. So this is telling us the number of atoms that it takes uh, to make the uh, elemental polyatomic molecule for that particular thing. So these are very standard. K compounds uh, build from elements. So compounds of elements are composed of two or more different elements joined by chemical bonds. And we used to do a lot of talk uh, about the chemical bonding at this point in the course, but they have uh, re-manipulated the content. So I'm not sure where we're going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about the bonds, but we'll talk about the bonds at a, at a later date. OK, there are two general types of compounds. Uh, the first one is called an ionic compound, and this is a uh, carryover from um, my old PowerPoints based on the old uh, ILMs. I didn't want to change this because I think it's a, a good time really to just drop the breadcrumb now uh, because this is what we'll be talking about later. But basically, two general types of compounds, uh, ionic, and don't worry about the fact that you're not going to see too much in the ILM about these right now. They will, uh, they will rear their ugly faces. Uh, in a couple of ILMs. And ionic compounds are formed by the attraction between a positive metal ion, which is called a cation, and a negative non-metallic ion, which is uh, called an anion. So opposites attract, and we call that an ionic bond. Uh, sodium chloride, or table salt, is a common example uh, of an ionic bond. And if it had numbers here, it would tell us the ratio of atoms that it takes to make the compound sodium chloride. If we don't see any numbers here, we assume that it's one and one. So if I took one, uh, one molecule of chlorine and one molecule of sodium and they bonded together, I would get sodium chloride or table salt at a one-to-one -one ratio. We'll talk about uh, how you tell what, what's a metal and what's a non-metal uh, in a future lecture. Second type of compounds is called a molecular compound, uh, and it's made up of two or more nonmetals. And that's the main distinction between ionic and molecular. Uh, ionics are a metal and a nonmetal, whereas moleculars are both nonmetals, and as such, they are held together by a different type of bond, which is called a covalent bond. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about this uh, later when we get into uh, organic chemistry. Uh, talking about hydrocarbons and things like that. As you'll see here, uh, CH4, which is the formula for methane, uh, 
these are both technically non-metals. Once we get to the definitions of non-metals, uh, it'll make more sense to you, but it tells us that we have one carbon bonded to four hydrogens in order to make uh, methane, and that is a molecular compound. Okay, now we'll look at uh, mixtures here. So mixtures are two or more substances that are stirred or mixed together that you can physically separate. Uh, it might not be easy, but it can be done. The components of the mixture are the solute and the solvent. So by definition, I think it uh, should be pretty easy for, for us to understand solvent. Uh, just like at work or in the shop or when you're painting, you need to dilute something. Uh, you add a liquid uh, solvent to it in order to dilute it. So in any mixture, the solvent is usually in the greater uh, proportion uh, and it's usually a liquid. And then the solute is usually in, in smaller uh, quantities. Uh, and is can be a solid liquid, or actually any of these could be solid liquid or gas, depending on what we're dealing with. You can have uh, mixtures of gases, obviously, mixtures of solids, and mixtures of liquids. Okay, uh, homogeneous mixtures here. Um, when mixing is complete, the resulting solution will have a uniform composition throughout, and the individual components cannot be seen with the naked eye, as we have here in uh, diagram A, it says all the samples contain 1% of salt dissolved in water. So this is a mixture of salt water. Uh, and if it is mixed properly and completely and all the salt dissolves, uh, we cannot see it in there. So we call that homogenous. The second diagram here on the right-hand side, oil and water, uh, obviously not uniformly mixed, even though we did stir it, they're not going to mix together very well. And we'll be able to clearly see uh, the two components of that particular mixture, and that is how we define a uh, heterogeneous mixture. So that takes us through the first little uh, section, I believe, and this is a new objective. I'm not sure what number it is, objective two or three, uh, where we're going to talk about the properties of matter. And this is of a little bit more interest to us in respect to our jobs. Uh, when we're dealing with the chemical reactions and, and things that occur uh, in refineries and chemical facilities, uh, we have to, you know, have a little bit of understanding. How do they make plastic? How do they get, uh, how do they get propane and butane uh, from oil and different grades of oil and things of that nature? Um, how do we measure the quantity and quality of products that are being produced? Well, we do that by understanding the properties of matter and the chemical, uh, the chemical and physical properties of matter, things like uh, boiling points, um, reaction rates, and things like that are, are covered as properties of matter. Okay, so we'll discuss uh, properties of matter in, in terms of physical properties, uh, chemical properties, um, what else? Uh, physical properties, chemical pro I think that's that's it anyway. There's all oh, physical changes and chemical changes. And I'll just get them all up here at once. Okay, so what is a physical property? And again, paying attention to the tech yellow. Uh, these are properties that can be observed and measured without changing the identity of the substance or object. So this can include things like color, taste, feel, smell, hardness, uh, flexibility, uh, you know, anything that's tangible, that, that is physical. Um, physical changes uh, on the, uh, in, in comparison to physical properties, these are changes that can be made that do not change the composition of the substance. So that's the common bond here between physical properties and physical changes is they are as they are and nothing, it, it, nothing is altered uh, in, a, in, a physical, in a physical way in terms of uh, chemical composition. Then we look at the chemical properties and chemical changes. So chemical properties uh, include the ability of substances to change into a new substance. Uh, it's, it's how the substance will behave when it comes in contact uh, with, a, with a different substance. So some chemical properties uh, can include, uh, re, you know, reactive, uh, is is a, a good one, or flammable is a, is another chemical property. Um, so things like that, they generally occur when there's something going on. Chemical changes, uh, a change resulting in a new substance with new chemical and physical properties. 
Okay, so it changes from one thing to another. If I have sodium in one hand and I have chlorine in the other hand, um, and then, then I combine them together, they react and then they become sodium chloride. So they have, they have changed. Usually there is some evidence that a chemical change takes place. Uh, this isn't in the ILM, at least not in this particular ILM, uh, but it will show up again somewhere else. But indicators that a chemical change has occurred include things like a color change, uh, a new solid forming, uh, we call that a precipitate, uh, changes in temperature, so uh, uh, heat going up or heat going down as a result of a reaction. Uh, fire is a good one that causes a change in temperature. Um, or a gas being produced that did not ex exist before. Uh, so these are chemical changes. Okay, looking at physical changes here uh, in a little bit more detail, a physical change again alters uh, the appearance, but not the composition, um, such as three phases of water. Uh, it's, it's a liquid, it's a gas, it's a solid. They physically are different. One of them is uh, soft and wet. Uh, one of them is soft and not wet, and one of them is hard and not wet. They're they're physically, they're they're different, but they're still water. Liquid water is still H2O. Water is a gas is still H2O, and an ice cube is still H2O. So it's a physical change when it changes states, but it's not a chemical change because it is still the same thing uh, molecularly. Okay, a phase change is a great example of a physical change. The ILM goes on to discuss in a little bit more detail uh, these particular changes in the in the phase changes of water. So talking about uh, changing from a liquid to a gas uh, is called evaporation, of course, achieved through heating. Uh, changing from a gas to a liquid is called condensation, of a result of cooling. Uh, this is the premise behind uh, distillation, uh, which we start talking about a little bit in third year here and we'll talk about more in fourth year uh, and again uh, different things uh, the processes that occur when going between phases so liquid to solid of course is freezing solid to a liquid is melting and then some some less common ones here that uh, we don't see or, or we don't usually talk about here going from a solid to a gas uh, is called sublimation and this is what happens when uh, like the frost disappears uh, and appears on your windshields in the morning. At, at night, the gas uh, cools and turns into frost on your windshield. And then in the morning, uh, sometimes you'll see it uh, heat up and turn into vapor and go away. Sometimes you don't. It just goes away, and that's called sublimation. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, the melting point of a solid is the same temperature as the freezing point of a liquid, right? Uh, when... When does something, when does something freeze? When does something melt? Right? It starts freezing at minus zero. It starts melting at just over minus zero. Right? So they're they're basically the same. Um, melting point of a solid is the same temperature as the freezing point of a liquid. Just as the evaporation temperature is the same as the condensation temperature. And don't take that absolutely literally. Uh, I mean, they're still different, but they're very very slightly different. We can go. Uh, zero uh, minus point 0.1 and it'll freeze and we can go zero positive point 0.1 and it'll start to melt technically by this definition boiling and freezing points are physical properties of a liquid so a couple of examples of a physical property of a liquid okay uh, a little bit more here on evaporating and boiling uh, pretty straightforward uh, boiling is the phase change that takes place within the liquid and occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure or greater than the atmospheric pressure on the surface of the liquid and basically that's just saying um, once the liquid gets hot enough that the uh, pressure created within it overcomes the pressure of the atmosphere it'll escape into the atmosphere as a vapor uh, evaporation uh, takes place on the surface of the liquid, obviously. Um, both evaporation and boiling are endothermic processes uh, which require uh, external uh, heat sources or cooling sources. Sublimation and deposition are also physical changes, uh, but these ones skip the intermediate steps. So instead of going from ice to water to steam, which has three steps and which is what we normally consider the the change between ice and, and a gas, um, it, sublimation is different. 
uh, dry ice is a great example of what happens with sublimation. It's a big chunk uh, of carbon dioxide and you take the lid off and it turns straight away into a gas. There is no liquid phase involved in there. Uh, deposition of water vapor, so the opposite. And these are I'm only talking about these two specifically because I'm well, I guess I did talk about these two, um, but the other ones are pretty, uh, pretty commonly understood, or at least I assume that they are. Okay, deposition of water vapor here uh, is simply the moist air or gas turning directly into a solid, and frost in the morning is a great example for that. Okay, now we'll talk about chemical changes here. A chemical change turns substances into new substances. That is the definition of a chemical change. Common example is the form and formation of rust on metal. Uh, rust is the reaction between the iron and steel and the oxygen in air, and it creates a new compound, uh, as you see here, iron oxide represented by these two different chemical formulas over here, FeO, iron oxide, uh, and iron uh, 2 oxide. We'll talk about that later on in uh, the course. Okay, uh, the example in the module talks about sodium, uh, both in its pure form and as a compound uh, with chlorine gas, which we commonly know as salt, NaCl. Um, sodium works completely differently with the two different things. If I throw a chunk of sodium, uh, pure sodium uh, into water, it's explosively reactive. And if you got a chance to get on the YouTube machine there, uh, just Google up pure sodium in water. There's hundreds of videos of it. Uh, it's quite an aggressive and exciting reaction. Um, but you take that same pure sodium and you react it with chlorine gas and it turns into delicious table salt. So uh, in either case, uh, we've had something change into something else. All right, uh, here's page 15, and we're talking about the atom, which to me is out of order. Uh, I would have preferred to see this ILM start out with the atom and then build on it from there, but I didn't write the ILM, so this is where we are. So we'll talk a little bit about the atom uh, because uh, a lot of things that are going on with the atom uh, fall into play when we start putting uh, compounds and formulas together, uh, where we get all our, our numbers and things uh, are generally related to uh, the, the formation of the individual atoms. Okay, the atom is the smallest particle of an element that can exist. Uh, insert bad dad joke here. Why should you never trust an atom? The answer is because they make up everything. You can use that later. You don't have to give me credit. Okay, an atom may be neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. This is uh, uh, somebody's law. I can't remember Newton's first law or somebody's law. I can't remember off the top of my head. But basically, uh, anytime you have a chemical reaction, uh, you put a couple of things in it and something different comes out of it, nothing is actually uh, destroyed. What you put in comes out in the other end uh, in terms of mass. It's just a different thing. Uh, and that is part of the continuity of life. Okay, the basic parts of an atom are the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The protons and the neutrons, collectively called nucleons, are in the nucleus. So the relationship between those two terms are here. And we see six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus of this model of an atom. The electrons control or occupy the space around the nucleus. Okay, this would be an example of a carbon atom, uh, and a carbon atom has six protons and six neutrons and six electrons. And we'll talk about the relationship between protons, neutrons, and electrons, and all of this stuff in the in the rest of this ILM. Okay, so these little particles that make up atoms uh, are very very small. They have very little very little mass. And as such, chemists had to create a new unit in order to represent this mass. And this atomic mass is a measure relative to a carbon atom, which has a mass of 12 AMUs. And this is probably the most confusing part of this course. Um, just throwing this AMU unit out there um, to tell you that it is how they measure 
things at an atomic level. And if you leave it at that, you'll be fine. Um, in terms of this course and the chemistry that we're doing, the depth that we get into, it really doesn't come into play. Uh, you'll see as we as we move forward when we talk about atomic mass or the weight of a particular element, um, the, the numbers that we see on the periodic tables, although they are not technically called the atomic mass units, they are very close and for our purposes, um, and for our purposes, oh my, we, we will use them as we see them. Okay, so where this mass unit comes from, again, is related to a, a carbon atom. Uh, it is a product of the six protons and the six neutrons that are making up this atom uh, with a little bit of contribution from the electrons. As you can see here, uh, if we were to break an atom uh, into uh, its components, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, the bulk of it is made up by protons and neutrons and a very, very, very small portion of it uh, contributed by electrons. Um, yeah, there might be a question here on what what part of an atom contributes the most mass, which part of the atom contributes the less mass. Okay, electrons, uh, negatively charged, protons, positive, pro, positive, positively charged, neutrons, neutral, no charge. Okay, so if we compare this to carbon, uh, and we'll move past this and you'll forget about it shortly, so don't, don't panic, but we're basing this off of carbon. So carbon has an atomic number of six and an AMU of 12, and we'll talk about how we get those numbers and how we use those numbers uh, momentarily. Okay, the atomic number, uh, I guess I should have had that diagram on here, is referred uh, to by the letter Z, uh, and it equals the numbers of protons, which are represented by P in the atom. So in this case, we have six protons. So the atomic number for carbon would be number six. And if you had your periodic table handy, then I guess this is a good point for me to tell you um, to go into course content and uh, print off. Uh, there should be two periodic tables in there. If there isn't, let me know and I'll make sure I get them in there. But there should be a normal periodic table of elements. And there will be another periodic table of ions. Uh, print them both off because it's nice to have them on individual pieces of paper for quick reference. Uh, and if you had them with you now, you'd be able to look up carbon in the periodic table and you'd see that it's got an uh, atomic number of 6 and an atomic mass of 12. And that is consistent for the rest of the course. Uh, and we just kind of discussed how we got to those numbers. Uh, that's basically what this ILM is going to do. So the mass number, uh, which is represented by an A, and this will make sense when I show you the next slide, uh, is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the atom. So A is equal to protons plus neutrons, and that relates to this AMU number here. So we'll see that uh, next. So for carbon, the Z number would be 6, the A number would be 12, and that'll make a bunch more sense, hopefully, on this slide here. So here's the A, here's the Z, here's the atomic symbol, uh, and here's where the charge would reside in a common element here. So A is the mass number, which is the number of protons and the number of neutrons together. Z is the atomic number, which is just the number of protons. X is the symbol for the element, so for carbon it would be a C. And then a charge, if there is a charge. Uh, a, neutral, uh, a neutral atom will have nothing here. Uh, a negatively charged atom will have a negative number up here. A positively charged atom will have a positive number here. We'll talk about that when we, when we cross that bridge. So example, looking at uh, carbon here, um, there's several different forms of most elements. Uh, we'll talk about them in the next couple of slides. They're called isotopes. Uh, and the carbon that we most commonly talk about is, is a mathematical collection of the uh, the sums of the different variations of that particular element in their, in their ratios of existence. We'll talk about a second. But if we were to look at uh, the examples I've, I have here, we have carbon, which has six protons. And in this case, uh, we'll have six protons and seven neutrons, because this number has to uh, include the number of protons as well as the number of, of neutrons. So if we know that there's six protons, 
and the remaining balance is neutrons. We just do 13 minus 6, and that tells us that we have 7 neutrons. And we call this carbon carbon 13, just as we called uh, this carbon carbon 12. Uh, this is the basis of the main carbon that we always talk about is carbon 12. Um, so there's carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. This is how we get these different names. So still carbon, six protons, but in this case, if I took 14 minus six, that would leave eight. I could say that there are eight neutrons in carbon 14. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay, that leads us into, uh, what the hell does this lead us into? Excuse me. Uh, isotopes, not quite yet. Okay, let's see if we can uh, wrap your head around that math here. Um, I think I got four slides here. So looking at uh, what we previously looked at using this diagram over here, we know the atomic number is equal to uh, P, and the mass number here is equal to P plus the neutrons. So let's figure out what we got going on here. We have hydrogen with a 1 down here, so that represents the number of protons. So that number is 1, our Z number is 1. We have no charge up here on this side, as we see here, no charge. So it's a zero. We have a one up here. This number is a combination of protons. Oop. Oh, oh, whoa, wipe out. This is a combination of protons and neutrons, and yet it's still one. Uh, so one minus one, hey, it should be zero, I believe. This is a mistake. Can someone just yell verify that I make a mistake here? I believe I did. This should be a, a zero. This one over here, uh, and I'm just giving you these examples. We're going to cover one example of each of what you're going to see throughout the course here, just so we can wrap our heads around it. So again, bottom number represents protons. In this case, one. Uh, oh, sorry, this is protons plus neutrons, so it should be one. So uh, this one's protons plus neutrons. It's only it's only one. So there's the one. We have a charge here um, of plus one. Holy moly, I think I got this right messed up. How many electrons do we have? Zero. I might have messed that up. Sorry about that. Let's look at the next slide and see if I can recover things here. Okay, let's look at something that will seem a little bit more common here. This is more in line with the exercise that you're going to have to do. So here we have oxygen represented by the atomic symbol O. Uh, eight in this position here tells us that we have eight protons. 16 in this position here tells us we have 16 minus eight neutrons. In this case, that would be eight. So eight neutrons, eight protons makes 16, which is this number here. Uh, our charge is nothing because we have nothing in this area over here. Looking at this variation of oxygen, this is an ion of oxygen. Uh, it has eight protons, just as the other one did. Uh, 16 minus eight tells us that we also have eight neutrons because neutrons plus protons gives us our A number. And then we take this negative two, and this is the first time, uh, hopefully, that I'm going to be able to explain this properly. We have a two negative charge here, which means that it is more negative than this version, right? If it's got a if it's got a negative charge, that means it's more negative. If it has a part positive charge, it means that it is less negative. That's the way I like to think about it. I don't like to think of it as being more positive. I think think of it as being less negative. So, as that logic would follow, then we're going to say uh, if this was neutral, I'm going to ask you how many electrons would I have in this atom. Well, if it's neutral, we have to have the equal number of negatively charged components as we would with positively charged components. So protons are positive, electrons are negative. In order to get a neutral atom, they have to be the same. So if I have eight protons, I also have eight electrons. That makes this zero. That's why we don't see that. So the electrons actually uh, should be... Uh, Jesus, my brain is uh, malfunctioning a little bit here today. It has no extra electrons. Let's put it that way. Okay, no plus or minus over the protons. This one here is more negative, so it means that it has more electrons 
then it has protons. If I have eight protons, that means I've got two more electrons than I would normally have. That would mean that I have 10 electrons. That's why we get the two negative charge. It's more negative than a neutral atom. Sorry, I've made this more confusing than it needs to be. All right, so now this page 24 here discusses the weighted average atomic mass, and this leads us to the numbers that we see on the periodic table. Anytime we have a sample of an element, you'll have a mixture of all the naturally occurring isotopes of that element. The atomic mass of that element that we see on the periodic table is the weighted average of the masses of those isotopes. So we looked at carbon. I told you that there was carbon 12, there was a carbon 13, there was a carbon 14. There's only one carbon on the periodic table. The number that we see that represents carbon on the periodic table is the weighted average of 12, 13, and 14 together gives us one number. The mass of each isotope is the mass when compared to the carbon-12 isotope. That's like the golden uh, measure by which all the other things are measured by. The unit of mass is called the atomic mass unit, and it is one twelfth of the carbon-12 atom. This is more painful than it probably needs to be. This means that the carbon-12 isotope has been assigned a mass of 12 AMUs. My opinion is they could take this right out of the ILM, but I'm going to make that uh, make this in here just because. So what does this all look like now that you're probably fully confused? Okay, we take carbon-12 and carbon-13. These are both naturally occurring isotopes of carbon uh, combined in, in their weighted average represent the carbon number that we see on the periodic table. And this slide talks about how we get that number. So carbon-12 has a mass of the isotope or AMU of 12 because it's got six protons and six neutrons and they're basically the same in terms of mass and it exists in its natural state in the world in the environment that we're talking about uh, as 98.892 percent so of all the carbon on the planet 98.892 percent of it is the carbon 12 type so we take that percentage 98 out of 100 percent multiply it by this 12 and it gives us a contribution of 11.867 amus we take the other isotope of carbon which has six protons and seven neutrons thereby having a different atomic mass unit because we're talking about things at the atomic level protons and neutrons makes 13. we take its occurrence natural occurrence in the world as 1.108 percent of all the carbons we multiply that number times 13 and its contribution to all the carbon in the world is this number we add the two numbers together we get 12.01 and this is the end of a long painful drawn-out story that tells you how we get the mass on the periodic table so again if you looked at your periodic table and you found carbon with the atomic number of six you would see that it has a mass of 12.01 grams per mole and from now on we can basically talk in grams per mole because it is essentially the same thing in our context a chemist would tell you different but in our context it's just fine Okay, so just to uh, make sure that we can do this, uh, if there's a math exercise, rest assured, uh, you're going to see this somewhere else in your future. So again, how do we do this? We take the naturally occurring isotopes of the element and they'll be given to you. So neon exists as neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22, different numbers of uh, neutrons. Same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. As such, they have a different atomic mass unit, and they have a different abundance in the world, the naturally occurring universe. So this isotope exists 90% of it. This isotope, 0.27. This isotope, 9.22%. So in order to get the atomic mass that we get on the periodic table, we take the weighted average of each contribution. So 20 times... 0.9051, 
would give us 18.102. 21 times 0 0.0027 or 0.27 percent would give us a number of 0 0.057 and 22 times 0 0.0922 would give us 2.02 .02. and we add all these together and we get an atomic mass unit of 20.187 or 20.19, which if you looked on the periodic table, you would see is the atomic mass of neon. So one, uh, one representation on the periodic table showing you the average of all the individual isotopes of that particular element gives us the number. So again, chromium, uh, you'll see occurs here in four isotopes that we show and the, the bigger the number on the periodic table the more isotopes that you'll get so some isotope or some elements will have uh, 10 20 isotopes uh, some like carbon will have three K again 50 times the percentage so you have to convert this into a percentage uh, 4.31 over 100 if you want to do it that way uh, or if you do it in your head uh, we know that 4% is 0 0.04, so 50 times 0 0.0431 gives us a number. 52 times 0.8376 gives us a number. 53 times uh, 0 0.0955 gives us a number. 54 times 0 0.0238 gives us a number. And we add them all together, and we get 52.06. Again, looking at the periodic table, this will be the atomic mass of chromium. So long drawn out and painful explanation of atomic mass units just to get us to understanding how we get the atomic mass off the periodic table. Holy moly, that was the end. I apologize for that being uh, a little bit messier uh, than it could have been. But uh, it was my first run through with the new ILM.